So today's TEDx conference focuses on the what's next with the goal of providing strategies for embracing trends that will shape our lives in the next 10 years and beyond. So based on my 18 years of experience as an educator, as a teacher, as an administrator, I've concluded that there is one line of inquiry that will provide the most compelling insights to support your maximizing your potential based on future trends. My solution, quite simply, is elephants. Yes, elephants. Sure, these massive mammals are lovable whilst frolicking amongst themselves in the savannas of Zimbabwe, or perhaps while enjoying a fresh drink at the watering hole in Thailand. But place Dumbo into a room, and he morphs into the proverbial elephant in the room. And ironically, the key to your success in the 21st century. Ergo, the title of today's presentation, Why Elephants Hold the Key to Success in the 21st Century. You're coming of age in an unprecedented cosmopolitan society where difference reigns. Presently, we live in a country where women represent 46% of the labor force. 30% of Americans identify as non-Christian or not affiliated with a particular religion. Gay marriage is currently legal in 37 states. Just 10 years ago, gay marriage was legal in only one state. The average American has an identity, or rather an awareness, of transgender identity. Ask people about uh, non-conventional, uh, non-gender binary terms 10 years ago, you would have had a different look. And in terms of race, the latest U.S. Census, 2010 Census, predicts that whites will represent a minority um, by the year 2040. Thus, in less than 25 years, people of color will represent a quantitative majority in this country. So no matter who you are, if you're black or white or Asian or Native American, if you're uh, economically disadvantaged, transgender, male, female, Jewish, um, you will have to develop some type of cultural competency in the 21st century. The 21st century will require that you develop skills to interact, collaborate with, and otherwise deal with people from multiple backgrounds. But the elephant in the room is that in the United States, we are strongly discouraged from acknowledging difference as a source of strength. The rules are fairly explicit. In polite company, there are four subjects that we do not mention sex, race, religion, and politics. These taboos, however, represent the very areas where the United States has experienced the most significant shifts from what was considered the norm, thus creating tension. Imagine the 1% movement or current issues around uh, livable wages, uh, gender inequities around wage distribution, uh, 2014 stats, women were earning about 77 cents to every dollar that men were earning, or even debates around religious freedom and pizza in Indiana. To be sure, each of these cultural elephants is uniquely complicated in its own right, and we certainly can't ignore intersectionality. So while I mentioned, uh, on average, women earned about 77 cents to every dollar men earned in 2014, if you were to disaggregate those numbers by race, in fact, women of color earned less. Uh, black women earned about 64 cents to the dollar, and Latinas earned around 55 cents. So of all the elephants in the room, I have found that the most deeply embedded is that of race. And there are numerous examples from our national discourse that we could draw from, uh, Baltimore being the most recent. So in spite of our increasing racial diversity, the thought of engaging in a conversation around race continues to elicit a quantifiable physiological reaction. Red faces, blood pressure rises, and there's a general sense of angst as to where the conversation might go. Indeed, we're not trained to speak about race. We're discouraged from speaking about race. We often feel as if we don't have the right vocabulary to talk about race, and no one wants to be called a racist. Equally important, depending on the environment, uh, there's risk of backlash for merely acknowledging race. 
You'll recall this was infamously evidenced when our black president, who is equal parts black and white, and whom we herald as evidence of our post-racial society, was critiqued because he acknowledged his own race when noting that had he a son, that his son would have looked like Trayvon Martin. So we're at a point where acknowledging difference, we're acknowledging race is akin to racism itself, or even worse, the dreaded reverse racism. So clearly when it comes to speaking about race, we don't see face to face. But literally, we actually see racial dynamics differently based on our racial positionality. This, I argue, is the fundamental challenge to addressing the elephant in the room, the racial elephant in the room. So you would think it would be as simple as taking facts and presenting a clear, logical, linear argument. But unfortunately, um, in the war between facts and perception, perception often wins. Consider this. In the summer of 2013, Americans were asked in Gallup's minority rights poll regarding their perception of why black males constitute a disproportionately high percentage of those incarcerated in the nation's prisons. <clears throat> Over 80% of whites responded that the cause was not discrimination, but something else. Well, here are the facts. The facts are that white Americans use drugs more than black Americans, but blacks are arrested for drug possession more than three times as often as whites. And these come from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Similarly, black men receive prison sentences that are 19.5% longer than those of white men who, are committed, uh, who have committed similar crimes. And those come from the 2013 report of US Sentencing Commission. So the question remains, why do we continue to hold such radically different racial perceptions, even in the, fa in the face of unbiased, unpartisan, uh, and rigorous data? Again, I think that elephants might help. I'd like to share a parable with origins from the Indian subcontinent about, about elephants. It's written by John Godfrey Sachs. Um, and this English adaptation highlights the challenges of perception. The blind men and the elephant. It was six men of Hindustan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall, against his broad and sturdy side, and once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very much like a wall. The second, filling the tusk, cried, Oh, what have we here, so very round and smooth and sharp? To me it is mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. So we have a wall and a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. So you get the picture. The fourth blind man felt the elephant's knee and thought it was a tree. The fifth touched his ear and thought the elephant was like a fan. And the sixth touched the tail and he was certain that the elephant was like a rope. The poem ends with an instructive moral. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceedingly stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. So we can draw a number of insights from these blind men, but perhaps the most instructive lesson is that each of the blind men's perception and subsequent reality was informed by his positionality around the elephant. The true nature of the elephant, then, is comprised of all of the perspectives of all of the blind men. So similar to the blind men, many of us are also blind. But we are color blind, and we're blind by choice. We proudly tout such slogans as, I don't see color, I just see people or we're all just American. In a 2014 MTV survey, 
of a nationally representative sample of participants between the ages of 14 and 24 years of age believe that having a black president proves that people of color have the same opportunities as whites. And 67 believed that Obama's presidency proves that race is not a barrier to accomplishments. Again, this is the majority perception in spite of the facts around racial disparities in education, income, housing, criminalization, et cetera. But to understand race relations in the United States, one also has to understand power. Power is the ability to transform one perspective into the definitive perspective. Power is the ability to decide that we live in a post-racial society in spite of evidence to the contrary. Figure this into your Baltimore analysis. Again, this is not about assigning blame. Rather, the goal is to consider how we might value multiple racial perspectives and experiences in a 21st century where the racial permutations are drastically different to what we have always known to be true. So the problem with colorblindness is that similar to the six blind men, colorblindness undermines an individual's ability to see and understand the entire elephant. Without the ability to view multiple realities and systemic dynamics, your racial assessment will necessarily lack critical insights from the experiences of other groups. This in turn informs how you view yourself and how you interact with others. Now this is more than just being right or wrong. This incomplete assessment, particularly when coupled with power, impacts people's lives in meaningful ways. So look at it another way. If we refuse to see race, then we are unable to acknowledge racial inequalities in the United States, which renders us ironically complicit to ongoing racial disparities. Why? Because we can't address what we refuse to see. So in the final analysis, ironically, colorblindness undermines the explicit goals of colorblindness, which is to subvert the power of race. So what was the point of this metaphorical elephant odyssey? And how exactly do elephants hold the key to your success in the 21st century? You are the future of this country, and the future is now. Each of you will enter an international educational system, a multicultural workforce, and a pluralistic civil, civic and political space where notions of normal and long-standing majorities are shifting like no other time in the United States. Our forefathers probably couldn't even have imagined a woman president, a transgender Hollywood icon, a gay mayor, a black female attorney general, or an Asian Houston Rockets player. But this is our amazing reality with innumerable opportunities to learn from each other, not only to increase collective knowledge, fuel technology and innovation, increase productivity, but also to promote greater humanity. So in closing, I challenge each of you to courageously embrace the elephants in the room but it will inquire or require intentionality. It is not organic. And the stakes are high. Because if you don't, we will continue to do what we have always done, which unsurprisingly will continue to yield the same outcome. But if you do accept the challenge, you have the opportunity to cultivate a society where who you are does not determine your ability to exercise your full humanity and citizenship. In order to function in this new world, you will have no choice but to recognize and tolerate difference. I hope, however, that you will aim not only to tolerate, but to respect the numerous differences and identities that comprise our society. For to tolerate difference is barely to tread water in an ever-changing society. To accept and, ex accept and respect difference, however, is to thrive 
in our increasingly multicultural world. Because when all is said and done, unlike the blind men around the elephant, each of you has the ability to remove the metaphorical blinders and courageously dare to view multiple perspectives and address the elephant. This is why elephants hold a key to your success in the 21st century. Thank you.